Hi, Kim students. My name is Miss Horn, and welcome to your first flip classroom lesson over measurements and calculations. This is chapter two in your textbook. I'm going to go ahead and remind you to utilize the pause and rewind button as necessary when taking your notes. So first of all, why is measurement important? In chemistry this year, we're going to be doing a lot of experiments that involve measurement. I also need to be able to trust you in order to measure correctly so that you don't mix together improper amounts of chemicals, which can be dangerous. So the basics of measurement. Most measurements are going to be quantitative. And they're going to have a degree of uncertainty because of human error. So we need to compare and contrast quantitative versus qualitative measurements. An example of qualitative is the test tube felt warm. An example of quantitative is the temperature reached 100 degrees. 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see there that 100 degrees Celsius is quantitative. It includes two things. It includes magnitude and a unit. So magnitude of 100 and a unit of degrees Celsius. In chemistry this year, you're going to encounter very small and large numbers. So scientific notation is going to be useful. So, there are a couple of ways or a couple of steps involved in converting a number into scientific notation. So, first we need to move our decimal so that there's only one non-zero digit to the left of the decimal. So, in this first number, 56,000, I want to put my decimal here. The one digit in front is a 5, so 5.6. Next, I want to express that number times 10. Count the number of times I had to move my decimal, and this is my exponent. So I'm going to move the decimal one, two, three, four times, so my exponent is a four. Then I need to determine if that exponent is going to be positive or negative. I need to look at my original number. If my original number is greater than one, meaning it's a big number, then my exponent should be positive. So I'm going to leave this exponent as positive. So 5.6 times 10 to the fourth power is the same as 56,000. Let's look at the next example. I have 0 0.095. I'm going to move my decimal two times to the right. So I have 9.5 times 10, and I know my exponent is a 2. However, this time my exponent is negative. Why? Because my original number was less than 1. It was a small number, which indicates a negative exponent. I also need you to take numbers that are in scientific notation and make them into standard notation. Okay, so I have the number 6.6 .6 times 10 to the fifth. In order to do this, first I'm going to look at the exponent. Since it's positive, I know this has to be a big number. So I want to move my decimal in a way that makes the number larger. To do this, I'm going to move the decimal to the right five times. So 6.6, .6, moving the decimal one, two, three, four, five times, turns this number into 660,000. At the bottom, I have a negative exponent, meaning that this is a small number. So I want to move the decimal three times to the left. One, two, three. I'll fill in those gaps with zeros so that my final answer is 0 0.00534. So again, you need to be able to change things into scientific notation. And if they're already in scientific notation, change them into standard notation. Okay, so our measurements also include units. So the unit is going to tell us what was measured. Was it distance? Was it mass? So units must always follow the numeric portion of the measurement. So there's two major systems in the world today. There is the customary system, which is used by the United States. We're pretty much the only people that talk about pounds and gallons. The rest of the world uses SI units, 
which are the international system of units, especially scientists. So we're going to use SI units in this class. Here are some SI units we're going to encounter in chemistry. If we're measuring length, we're going to use the meter. For mass, a kilogram. For time, the second. For temperature, we're going to use something called Kelvin. And for the amount of this for the amount of a substance, we're going to use something called a mole, which measures things like atoms, molecules, formula units. We'll talk about these much later, but they're very important in chemistry. So the metric system has prefixes, which we're going to use with the SI units to represent quantities that are either larger or smaller than our base units. We need to have the portion of the metric system memorized from kilo all the way to nano. So some people find this saying helpful. King Henry danced before drinking chocolate milk. This helps us to remember kilo, hecto, deca, our base unit, deci, centi, and milli. Now that's only one portion of what I told you you needed to memorize. So we need to go past milli into micro, this little u is a micro symbol, and nano. Larger than a kilo, we do have some units like mega, giga, and tera, but usually those are used when we're talking about computer memory, not in chemistry. So again, kilo all the way to nano. Well, as you know, the metric system is based on powers of 10. So our base unit has a value of 1. As we move to the left, this increases by 10s in order to get bigger. So a Deca is going to be 10 times larger than our base. Hecto will be 100 times bigger. And kilo will be 1,000 times bigger. If I move to the right, things are going to get smaller based on a value of 10. So deci is worth 0.1 when compared to the base. Centi, 0 0.01, and milli, 0 0.001. So it's like the decimal is just moving, because it's getting 10 times smaller. Well, when I move from milli to micro, there's kind of a break here. It's much smaller. So I'm going to use scientific notation. Micro would be 10 to the negative 6 power. And nano would be 10 to the negative 9. In chemistry, I'm going to need you to be able to convert between your metric units. So we need to be able to write things called equalities. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but first we need to write out our metric system. So King Henry danced before drinking chocolate milk, and then remembering micro, which is the little u, and nano, which is the n. Our base units that we're going to use in chemistry are the meter, the liter, and a gram. Meter for distance, liter for volume, and gram for mass. So I can ask you to write equalities relating liters and deciliters. So if I asked you to do that, here are the instructions you need to follow. To relate two metric units to each other, start by putting a 1 on the larger unit. So which one's larger, a liter or a deciliter? Well, since the liter is further to the left, it's larger. So I'm going to have one liter equals so many deciliters. Count the number of metric place moves to the desired unit. It's only one space over. This is the same number of zeros you must add on to make the conversion since the metric system is based on powers of 10. So every time I move over 1, it's either 10 times bigger or 10 times smaller. So I know 10 deciliters equal 1 liter since it's just one place movement, since it's just one movement to the right. I can continue this. Um, what if I asked you to relate 
leaders and center leaders. Well, since leader is further to the left, it gets the one. So many centiliters. Since centi is one, two places to the right, it would be 100. And this continues. So this is 10, 100, 1,000. Now there's a break here. So this is going to be 10 to the 6th. And this is going to be 10 to the 9th for nano. Okay, and that's if we're comparing it to the base unit, which is getting the 1. So it has to do with how many steps you're moving over. I may not ask you to start with the base unit. You may start with something else. So let's look at a problem like that. Okay, so what if I ask you to compare um, hectograms and centigrams? Okay, so that's kind of a strange conversion, but what if I asked you to do so? Well, you know, hecto is larger, so it's going to get the one. One hectogram equals so many centigrams. See how many places it is over. One, two, three, four. If we ever get to the point where it's bigger than three, because this is 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, there's too many zeros. So if it's more than three zeros, we're going to write it in scientific notation. So I can just say 10 to the fourth centigrams equals one hectogram. So it's acceptable up to a thousand to write the zeros, but if it's greater than a thousand, write it in scientific notation. We'll practice this more in class to make sure you master it. Okay, so we also have derived units, which are units produced by multiplying or dividing the simple units we talked about. An example of derived units for volume is the cubic centimeter, which includes length times width times height. It's important to note here that one cubic centimeter is equal to a cc, which is used in medical applications which is also equal to a milliliter. So this is all equal volume. Another example of a derived unit is density, which is the ratio of mass to volume for a substance. Units include grams per cubic centimeter, grams per milliliter, and grams per liter. If you've ever measured something several times, you know that your results may vary. In science, it's important for our measurements to be useful, and they need to be reliable. So they need to be accurate and precise. So what does that mean? Accuracy is the closeness of a measurement to the correct or accepted value. So accuracy is correctness, whereas precision is reproducible reproducibility. It refers to the closeness of repeated measurements to each other. Let's look at some examples. The true volume of a sample of water is 33.3 milliliters. The measurements made were 22.4, 22.2, 22.4, and 22.3 milliliters. Well, these are close to each other, but not to the actual value, so they're precise, but not accurate. Um, which isn't really good. We need it to be both. So this is just precise. Let's look at the next one. The true length of copper wire is 58.5 centimeters. Our measurements are 58.4, 58.5, 58.5, .5, and 58.4. This is what we want, accuracy and precision. They're close to each other and close to the actual accepted value. The last one, the true mass of a sample of zinc is 14.5 grams. Measurements made are 13.2, 15.6, 17.9, and 12.0. These are kind of all over the place and not really close to the true mass. These are neither, and this is not what you want to experience in lab. You want precision and accuracy, not something random like this last example. Okay, so percent error is our last calculation in this video. It's a calculation that scientists use to compare an experience 
experimental results with a theoretical or accepted value. We're going to use them in our class as a lab quality check. If your lab went well, you have a low percent error. If your lab went poorly, you have a high percent error. So it's a very simple calculation. It's the accepted value minus experimental value divided by accepted times 100. So let's look at an example. Calculate the percent error in a length measurement of 4.25 centimeters if the correct value is 4.08. So this correct value is the accepted one. The measurement that we took will be our experimental value. So the accepted is 4.08 centimeters minus our experimental 4.25 centimeters divided by the accepted 4.08. Now notice if I do 4.08 minus 4.25, I get a negative number. So that's why these absolute value bars are here. Percent error cannot be negative, okay? So take the absolute value of the numerator always. Then because this is a percent, I need to multiply by 100. After putting this in my calculator, I get a percent error of 4.17%. This is a good percent error because it's low. That means that my um, lab went really well and I had minimal error. If you have something like 90%, that's not good. This concludes our first tutorial over measurement. I hope you took great notes, and I look forward to seeing you in class tomorrow.